particularly along the South Fork River. So we have done that. We have worked with stakeholders and with the county. Uh, we have invited some guests from uh, the state, from Mecklenburg County, from Gaston County, and some of our neighbors. We've got our friends from Cramerton here um, because we're all part of the South Fork River and certainly the Catawba River. So we want to make sure that uh, we all have consistent regulations to the extent that we can so that we're protecting our, our natural resources on the, both rivers, but in particular the South Fork River uh, where we have some development pressure now. So I would ask Shelly DeHart to introduce her special guests and we'll get started with this presentation. And we've got an outline of sort of how we want to go about the presentation, which is found on page four of your agenda packet. Thank you, Adrian. So I'd first like to introduce Mr. Shannon Leonard. Uh, he is with the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, he has about 19 and a half years with the agency and has been serving as the assistant regional engineer for the last 15 years. Uh, he served in the Winston-Salem regional office from 1995 until transferring to the Mooresville regional office, which regulates our area, in 2019. Uh, he has conducted plan reviews and field inspections for compliance, uh, <coughs> as well as spent time in the agency uh, within the Division of Air Quality for about six and a half years. So I'd like to... And before we get started, I meant to set some ground rules for this discussion, kind of what, what we're doing here, the scope of this discussion. So this is a presentation by some experts about water quality and stormwater and erosion control for them to, to give you information, for you to ask questions, and for you to give us direction as to how you want to proceed with this whole process of <laughs> updating ordinances and regulations. This is not a public comment period. It's not a public hearing. It's not a public discussion. Uh, we have interested parties and we have staff here who can answer questions, but there will be time for public engagement throughout this process. So this is really a discussion between the, the mayor and council and our invited guests. Mm -hmm. okay. Good evening. I think she just wanted time for me to just kind of give a brief overview of the erosion control process or rules and regulations uh, from the, the state has the Cement Pollution Control Act of 1973. That kind of sets the frame groundwork for erosion control throughout the state. And um, the purpose of us having the erosion control program is to keep sediment damage from the streams and rivers and uh, harming aquatic wildlife and that type, those types of things. Um, Thank you. you have natural erosion that occurs primarily, you know, when over natural processes and then you also have it during human activities which is basically when we have land disturbing activities and those land disturbing activities uh, can produce sediment runoff into the streams and wetlands and channels and stuff that can cause the, the damage to the habitat um, we also have the uh, administrative rules that we uh, re have regulations by for road control uh, as well um, what, what else would you like to know? Well, um, I think I'm just trying to give a basic overview, yeah. per se. I mean, I think our interest lies mainly in um, you all's authority vis-a-vis -vis, um, county and, and local authority. Um, that's s somewhat uh, of what our discussion was. So obviously, we can't go. We can't be. We, we can't be looser than you all for, for lack of but like you know if, if you set a threshold here we can't have a lower threshold right. but we can go further than than you all and so I, I think that's sort of our, our curiosity just in terms of you know if we want to set these measures in place um, and it seems like Mecklenburg uh, has, has done that um, you know what assistance can you provide what sort of the lay of the land so that we're operating uh, consistently with with you all and, and perhaps going further but we're not um, acting contrary to to what you all are doing yeah so I mean the set of pollution control act would be your basic standards across the state and if you was going to start some type of a local program to to uh, enforce erosion control then you would need to meet at least the minimum standard and then um, you can be more stringent what the state is 
You just can't be a less preacher. <clears throat> and then we'll come in, Russ may touch on this as well, but we come in and we also do um, checks and bounces on your, on your program as well mm -hmm. to be sure that you're doing at least the basic minimum that's required. So if, 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 if we're more stringent than you all are, does that mean we have to have our own group of folks to enforce that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And you would you'd have to have your own road control yeah. program set up for that case. How and many? You can, um, you can do that through going through your Raleigh with, with, our, with our office to, to get all the stuff that you need to do. Is that something that somebody on staff can be trained to do or does that require a new position? Um, you'd have to have positions, you know, if you're going to create your own program or somebody's got to be there to, because you're going to have to have field personnel to go out in the field and then do inspections on the field. And you're going to have to have also have office staff in, internally to review plans and stuff that are submitted to you and to approve those plans. So you'll probably have to have some engineers on board um, to review the plans and those types of things. Are those plans something that you could farm out to an engineering firm or you necessarily have to have them on staff? <coughs> uh, that's going to probably be a legal question, but you're probably going to want to do that in house. So the inspectors and our planning and zoning folks, this is not something that they could take on. We would have to create kind of a new department. Yeah, I don't know if Rusty can shed any light on that since they've done that, but I don't know how you, how you get into different offices or different sections doing various tasks okay we're just trying to get a grasp on the complexity of it if it's something that we could do in-house or if it's going to require and that's just the road control aspect yeah. of you have stormwater too you know some some counties that they they take care of that some areas depends on where you're at what you're doing it falls to our purview where we review that that stuff some other areas it goes to the local municipalities and they they do that it just it all depends on where you're at are you aware of any uh, municipalities of similar size to ours that, that have their own program? Uh, there's several throughout the state. You can go to our website and there's a local okay. program link on our website and that tells you every every program that has a local program or every state, or not state, but city or mm -hmm. county yeah. uh, that is has been approved through across the state. The most important thing is that we keep the river clean. That's, that's what we've got to do. Yes. The utility that came across the South Fork, which is on, in our area, <coughs> did they submit plans to you guys before they came across? Because they ended up, we understand, dumping a, a large amount of sediment, and then I think you had to come in. Mm -hmm. But I don't, from what we heard, you they didn't get fined. Explain to us a little bit about how that kind of thing works. Can you, I couldn't hardly hear you very good. What? I'm okay. Sorry. A utility came across the South Fork River and they dumped sediment in the river. Mm -hmm. Our understanding is that your group was contacted and that no fine was issued. Is that correct? Or did they submit plans to you before they came across the river? Because we it came across into our area, but we were not, you know, we were not involved in it. Uh, I'd have to know the project and all that kind of information work in the location. Okay, I'll get the project. information to you because it, that was a serious thing that happened. And as our, we understand that nothing was done as far as a fine goes. So that would tell us a little bit more about what we need to be aware of. So I'll get the information to you. Okay. Yeah, that's why I asked the question. Okay, we'll need to find out. Okay. Okay. Yeah, if you if you start your own local program then any kind of work within all the private funded projects will come to you for approval at that point in time. Mm -hmm. The only thing that, that we that would come to us at that point would be uh, public funded projects. 
if if those do come to you, do you inspect or do you how do you address the situation? Mm -hmm. If a big project comes to you for approval, um, what do you guys do? So if a plan comes to us for approval, then we review the plan, be sure that there's adequate measures on the pro on the on the plan to keep the sediment within the right of way of the of the project. And just a utility line. Okay, and who monitors it? Do you have staff that monitor that? Yeah, we have field we have field personnel to go and do okay. that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so our next speaker uh, is Mr. Russi Ozell. He manages Mecklenburg County's water quality program with uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg Stormwater Services. Now the program is charged with maintaining and restoring the quality and usability of the county's surface water resources, including over 3,000 miles of streams in two river basins and 190 miles of shoreline in three of the 11 lakes that comprise the Catawba River system. Rusty is a native of Mecklenburg County and a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Uh, he has worked for Mecklenburg County uh, for 41 years with 38 of these years as head of the water quality program, which includes a staff of 30. Some of the activities performed by the program include water quality monitoring, <coughs> identification and elimination of pollution sources, phase one and phase two stormwater permits, compliance, inspection of wastewater treatment plants, responding to citizen requests for service, and emergency situations uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Public education involvement regarding water quality protection, enforcement of local water quality ordinances, water quality modeling, restoration of impaired waters, and development and implementation of watershed management plans. So uh, I don't think he needs much further introduction. So uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Rosette, <laughs> uh, come on up there. Can you unhide slide six? Unhide slide six. So. Let me, uh, I can if I pop out of this. Okay, give me a second. So, first and foremost, thank y'all for inviting me to be here today. It's been a long time since I've been spoke to anybody in Belmont. Yeah. It's always a pleasure. Um, so, I'm going to start off talking a little bit about the river and how important it is which y'all already know that, but I spend a lot of time over in the city of Charlotte telling them that because they're so far removed from the Catawba River, they don't see it every day and they don't really realize the importance of it, but it's vitally important, not just Belmont, but to our, our entire region. Absolutely. Hugely important. Most people yeah. have no concept of really how important it is. Yeah. And, and what we're seeing in, in Mecklenburg County is a huge increase in development, particularly in Lake Wiley, which is probably not good news to Belmont, Mount Holly, and others downstream of us who use Lake Wiley. But it, we have seen just in the past five years a, a 30%, 30% increase in the amount of impervious area in the portion of Mecklenburg County that drains to Lake Wiley and South Charlotte. So there, there are a number of developments down there, Barry Wick, uh, River District, uh, Palisades that have sprung up over the past couple of years mm -hmm. that have really, <coughs> thank you, caused, thank you, caused a huge surge in, in development in that area, an increase in pervious area. And so I think, I hope, We've learned a few things really over about the past 20 years that maybe can help you. I guess probably the most important thing I'm going to say here today is to offer our help going forward. Uh, and in a very polite, um, undomineering, cordial, not, mm, how would you say, cooperative manner, not coming out to you and saying, we know how to do this, y'all need to do it that way. Because believe me, we don't really know how to do it. We're still trying to figure it out. It's very complicated. I think the advantage we have is that we, we have a lot of resources. 
that that y'all may not have and we try to really use these resources wisely as a matter of fact today i've got olivia edwards olivia can you stand up this is olivia edwards she's on our water quality staff and she's a supervisor over our lake monitoring program and one of the things i'm going to talk about toward the end of the presentation is how we are implementing a cove assessment and protection program we started last year but we're beginning this year a full board and we've hired davidson college a professor there to help us understand how sediment behaves in the cove because you you probably know this already but it, it's not just as easy as mud running into a cove and settling out there are all kind of dynamics that go on in the cove i know y'all have heard a lot about bathymetric surveys and the value of them why they may not be good why they are good but we're trying to figure that out ourselves and we're we've engaged davidson college are doing some sediment core samples in the cove to try to figure that out and we're going to learn a lot over the next year so I'm, I'm here today just to show you some of the things we've done, some of the things we've learned, but more importantly, to, to invite you as we learn, uh, maybe you can, we can share some of that with you as, as you grow and as we grow, we grow together. And this is a picture here, this first slide, one of my favorite pictures. It's where Mountain Island Lake ends there at the dam and where Lake Wiley begins on the downstream side of the dam. And of course, that's Mount Holly's jurisdiction on the left and Mecklenburg County jurisdiction on the right. You see the mountain island for which the lake is named there in the middle. Dam was built in 1927. So this, this lake literally sustains us. It sustains us because it provides us with our drinking water supply reservoirs. And that's, that's key, obviously, because if we don't have these reservoirs, we don't have these drinking water Supplies, then you know we can't function as a community now we've got on the lakes we've got here in the slide you see lake norman mountain island lake the south fork coming into lake wiley and lake wiley which y'all are all very familiar with in mecklenburg county we got portions of lake norman mountain island and lake wiley we've got 190 miles of shoreline so we've been dealing with problems on these lakes a number of lakes for a number of years and one of the thing that makes Mountain, Island, these lakes so vitally important is that we've got water intakes on these lakes, and this picture shows you the intakes that we do have, and you can count them there. We've got eight different intakes on the lakes there in Mount that border us and y'all, and that includes intakes on Mountain Island Lake, uh, Lake Norman, and Lake Wiley. Y'all got several intakes on the South Fork. And on some of the, when I say y'all, I mean Gaston County. He's got several intakes on the South Fork. And y'all's drinking water intake for the city of Belmont, of course, is on Lake Wiley. Uh, y'all, which y'all, according to the data provided to us by the uh, Catawba Watery Water Resource Management Group, which I'm sure y'all probably familiar and heard of them, that y'all are with y'all on about 2 million gallons of water a day from Lake Wiley to provide your residents with their drinking water. Mecklenburg County is which y'all on about 100 million gallons of water a day for the residents over there. Gastonia, about 20 or 30. Mount Holly, about 10 or 12. You add it all up, it's almost 140 million gallons of water drawn every day from these three lakes to provide the sole source of drinking water to well over a million people, which that's enough water to fill Panther Stadium two times. So, and, and y'all may or may not be aware of this, but there are only really two sources of drinking water in the world, really, and that is groundwater and surface water. Mm -hmm. That's the two states that the water exists other than in the atmosphere. Groundwater here in the Piedmont in North Carolina, Mecklenburg County, Gaston County, and all the counties around us is trapped in cracks and rocks. And it's very difficult to get a good yield out of a groundwater well to provide drinking water to a large community. Now, I imagine Belmont at one time probably had wells to provide them with drinking water, but you outgrew those wells as your population grew. So, and that's what's happened in communities all through the Piedmont. As a matter of fact, I checked the, the state database and I could find, I found only one or two small communities that still rely on wells for their drinking water in the Piedmont. Everybody else gets their drinking water from surface waters. Now, if you get further to the coastal plain, you have what's called a confined aquifer, which is kind of rivers trapped underneath the ground between layers of limestone. Now, those can provide great yields of, of water, but 
our whales, if you get 20 to 50 gallons a minute out of a whale, that's great. And you need 10 times that much to provide your community water. So that's why we all use all the communities in Gaston, Mecklenburg, Lincoln, we all get our drinking water from, from surface water supplies. And you can see there in that picture is the intakes for Mount Holly and Gastonia, and those are on Mount Nile Lake. The picture at the, at the top, excuse me, kind of illustrates what a typical well for a home is where you drill a hole, intersect groundwater, pump it out of the ground, and of course provides water to the, to the household which is just ineffective for a municipality in the Piedmont. So we're stuck with surface water sources. And uh, that's one reason why these lakes are so vitally important to us. But another reason, and, and you know, I've been around a little while. I've probably been around most longer, most, longer than most of y'all. So I can remember, I grew up on the Catawba, and I can remember when people that used the Catawba were called river rats and were kind of looked down upon, you know, uh, but nowadays it seems everybody wants to live on the Catawba River. And something that's really a phenomenon that I didn't know that I'd ever live to see is multifamily development on the river. So there's a lot of high density development that's occurring along the river. The, the use of the Catawba River is more than it has ever been. Uh, the Duke Energy estimates that about 10 million people visit a Catawba River Lake every year and it's expected to go up 11% per decade through 2050. So Lake Wiley's busy, Lake Norman's busy, even Mount Island Lake is busy with boats this time of year. Heavily used, heavily relied upon, very important resource to the community. But there's something that, that I think kind of escapes a lot of people, and that is just how vulnerable these lakes are. It's kind of hard to see. But this is a, a slide that illustrates this is part of Mecklenburg County. Lake Wiley's on your left. The brown area there is Mecklenburg County. And this is what we call Beaver Dam Creek. You see there in red. And it flows into Browns Cove, which is that large sort of mouth-shaped area there at the end of the creek that then flows into Lake Wiley. Now, what happens in, the, in these creeks is, so you get a land-disturbing activity or you get sediment that enters, enters a creek and it flows downstream to the lake, and then it hits a cove, which is still, it's not moving. And so what happens, the sediment settles out. Not only that, but the nutrients, any other pollutants, they concentrate in that cove. And whoever lives in that cove is subject to that and can experience some very unpleasant situations with problem plant growth, People can't hardly swim in the water because they get plants tangled up around their feet. They lose water frontage or water depth at their docks. Uh, they maybe encounter high bacteria counts in the water that make it unusual for swimming. All these things can occur as that watershed that drains to that creek and the creek to that cove is that watershed adds impervious area buildings and hard surfaces. And when it rains, of course, that water doesn't soak into the ground, it runs straight into a storm drain pipe and straight into the creek. And that, that causes a lot of erosion, it causes a lot of problems downstream in the, in the cove. And you were asking about a uh, local authority and the, the city of Belmont has the authority to adopt ordinances. You have the authority to adopt uh, erosion and sedimentation control ordinances. You had the authority to general to adopt what we call post-construction ordinances that require certain control measures after a project is completed to collect and treat stormwater before it enters a lake. And you have the authority to adopt pollution control ordinances to make it illegal to uh, illegally discharge into your storm sewer system or straight to a water body. Now, what we have. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying this is the way, that I think there's somebody here from Gaston County that's gonna speak after me, and I'm not advocating this at all, but I'm just giving you this as an example. So we have two towns in Mecklenburg County that have their own erosion control ordinances. We have the town of Davidson and we have the town of Mint Hill. Now they, they have their own ordinances because Davidson has jurisdiction in Iredale County and Mint Hill, <coughs> has jurisdiction in Union County. So they have to have their own, own ordinance because 
the county attorney at the time said we couldn't enforce a county ordinance in another county. Well, found out since you really can, if the municipality gives you the authority to do so. But anyway, these two towns had their own erosion control ordinance and they delegate us to enforce it for them. So you could do the same thing. If, if now, of course, please forgive me, Gaston County, they're gonna kill me, but um, if, if they, were, though they were so inclined um, to do that for you, you could do that. And, and you actually write your ordinance and put in there that they enforce it for you. And you could do that with, that's what we call a, a, a construction site erosion control, the erosion control, that's controlling sediment and other pollutants during construction. You can do that for post-construction. You can have your own rules to the city of Belmont. You can enforce them or you could get the Gaston County to enforce it again if they were willing to do so. Uh, and you could do that with other pollution control ordinances. You have that authority. And I hope, I don't know if you're attorney here, I hope I'm not stepping out of line there, but that's just from experience what we learned over there in Mecklenburg County. So some of the other things we've done um, as an example, other things. So we, we over there in Mecklenburg County have had a water quality program since 1970. And since probably 71, we've had a, had a boat out on the lakes collecting water samples. So we've been doing this right at 50 years. We've done a lot of different things. We've seen all kinds of things. As Mecklenburg <coughs> County has grown from 1970, a population of 375,000 people, we're at 1.1 million people today. So you can imagine all the stuff we've seen, all the sewer spills, all the water quality problems we've had to deal with and encounter over all these years. These are some pictures up here. That's McDowell Creek Cove on the top, full of sediment that's pouring down into McDowell Creek Cove uh, that is just right upstream of our drinking water intake. So we've had to battle pollution sources near the city of Charlotte's drinking water intake. Another thing that's happened just in the past 10 years is Mecklenburg County now owns a public water, a public swimming area uh, along the shores of Lake Norman at Ramsey Creek Park. So we are up there collecting water samples to see if there are elevated bacteria, E. coli levels in that water. And if there are, then we would close the swimming beach mm -hmm. so people wouldn't swim. And that happens sometimes. It's human related, sometimes it's geese uh, that do their business in the water and that causes high mm -hmm. bacteria counts. We don't want people swimming in that. The other thing we do, and you maybe have heard this, that um, we had a discharge of 800,000 <coughs> gallons of sewage into Paul Creek yep. Saturday, or actually Friday, we found out about it Saturday. So we even, we've closed the entire Paul Creek Cove to, to swimming. That's another thing that we do. If there's a, a sewer leak that occurs and we know it's reached a lake where people swim, we don't do it for all the creeks, just the lakes, the lakes on the Catawba. If we know that's happened, we immediately post it, no swimming, because that's kind of nasty. It, you know, you get a lot of bacteria and you cause it, have a lot of problems. And we've had and documented situations where kids have developed some pretty serious eye and ear infections from swimming in water that has elevated bacteria levels. So we do know that it can cause some negative health impacts. The other thing that's kind of also a phenomenon, which is kind of illustrated by the third picture down there, is that we're having problems with increased plant growth hydrilla and other nuisance plants. And in some places on Lake Norman, you know, the plants literally take over the cove and cause really significant problems and how those coves can be used. So we have a water quality monitoring program year round where we monitor the quality of the water in our three lakes every other month. And then from May through September, we're out there collecting samples every month for bacteria to determine whether or not, and these are in areas like if docks or let, let's say marinas or other areas we know that are frequented by people, we're sampling them on every month during the summer to see if we have elevated counts. If we did, then we would put up no swimming advisories and put out a media release, no swimming advisories. Most of those swimming advisories that we issue are the result of sewer spills at the end of the lake. So we work with Charlotte Water uh, and trying to protect their drinking water intake. So we do some special monitoring for them. 
and you know this for example for hydrilla and other pollutants that they're concerned about at their intake because of the impacts that this will cause to their drinking water supply so we, we've got a lot of different programs a lot of different things that we've tried over the years and and frankly I, I think a lot of them do work one of the things that that we've done which I think has been a big big success is that all the areas and critical we call them critical areas these are the areas in Mecklenburg County you see colored there that drain to one of our reservoirs we've identified these as critical areas for enhanced erosion control measures so we require that in these areas that there's there for example a high hazard double row high hazard silt fence larger sediment basins restrictions on the amount of area that you can uncover you know how quickly you have to seed that area once the construction is finished and that that is really something that that we've done many years ago that that really has helped another example is that we in Mecklenburg County we've adopted some enhanced I mentioned earlier post construction controls again erosion control is what we call construction site pollution control post construction site pollution control those are the controls you put in after the development you put them in when it's being developed but they serve to protect water quality after everything's built so those are the ponds the other devices that filter water so we had more <laughs> those critical areas that I showed you in the previous slide the areas which is in blue and kind of pink and blue up there uh, those areas we have enhanced controls most the state minimum standards if you had these ponds or these water quality control measures at 24 percent and those areas for increased protection we require those controls at 12 percent and the other thing that we do is we require nutrient removal water buffers and other enhanced protection measures in those critical areas so you can do this for erosion control during construction and post construction which is kind of the, the avenue that we've taken so the, the other thing that, that we've done over the years, um, really for about the past 20 years, and I think probably the best example of this is the Palisades development, which was a 1,500-acre development down there off York Road in southern end of Charlotte, Mecklenburg County. And back in 2020, uh, we required them to do a lot of added measures to protect water quality in the many coves that were along there developed areas and we've kind of done that ever since we even did it before them to some extent so what we do is we work with in this case most cases the city of Charlotte but any of the jurisdictions we've got six towns the county no longer has zoning authority we lost that with the ETJ designation but we work with the city of Charlotte and the other towns and if there is a rezoning where there is increased development increased impervious area uh, and it's draining particularly if it's draining to a lake then we will as part of the, the conditions for the rezoning require enhanced measures to protect the lake and they would include enhanced measures mainly for construction enhanced erosion control measures even above and beyond those enhanced measures that i pointed out earlier for example one of the things that we have done is that we require i know y'all encountered this in your recent rezoning the continuous automated monitoring, uh, sometimes wider buffers, uh, sometimes bathymetry, bathymetry studies, um, sometimes other measures that we feel like are needed in order to protect water quality. We will work the jurisdiction to put that in the conditional rezoning. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to spend as much time on this. Um, this is an example of a situation that we encountered in Brown's Cove. I showed you the slide earlier. You can see the cove here, um, the shape of it. It kind of got that little pinch point and then it bends around to the right. And we've got Beaver Dam Creek that flows into this. And this is a situation, it's a 3,200 acre watershed. And between 2003 and 2012, uh, we had over 800 acres disturbed for an average of two and a half years. And we required as part of the rezonings on some of these, they do bathymetry. And, and we had data spanning over nine years. These are results of some of the bathymetry. When we compared the, the bathymetry, which is nothing more than a fancy fish finder, showing the depths 
of the water, that does it disservice. It's, it's basically uh, my simple mind. It's basically just a mapping of the bottom and the depth. And you compare that depth pre-construction to post-construction, and as you can see, the red area there indicates where we've had significant accumulation of sediment. And this is a little confusing. Just think of the blue as water and the brown as sediment. So in 2003, you can see that we had a little over three feet. I can't see. Brown's Cove is an anomaly. Y'all probably don't have a lot of Brown's Coves in Belmont, but it's a large watershed. We had the airport, Charlotte Douglas Airport, had a lot of grading going on. And they're notoriously bad for causing downturn. You'd think the city of Charlotte would do a better job. They don't. They have a lot of problems on all their construction sites. And we had I-45. Both of those contributed hugely to the sediment accumulation. Long story short, in, in May of 2015, we engaged in a dredging operation. So the way we did that is we identified all the developers in the watershed during that time period when we had that sediment accumulation. We knew how many years of the, they had ground uncovered, and we knew how much ground they had uncovered, and we knew that our dredge was going to cost about half a million dollars. So we developed a multiplier based on the number of years they had ground uncovered and the size of the ground they had uncovered. Multiplied that times half a million dollars, and that was their cost share. And the state chipped in about three hundred thousand uh, dollars, and the airport chipped in about you know about hundred thousand dollars. So the developers made up a little over a hundred thousand dollars. They split it amongst some sales. We used the Mecklenburg County Soil and Water Conservation District. They managed the dredging operation, and we ended up removing. water and then, and then we spread it out uh, but it it was it was very successful but it was a mess because what happened is we had 25 people that lived on that code and they were relying on the government to protect their water I mean you know we have a lot of programs in place to do that and we so let them down Imagine that, losing 60% of your water depth. That's, that's bad. Some people couldn't even use their docks anymore. It was bad. It was bad. We, it relied on the cooperation of a lot of people. It relied on a lot of shoestring mathematics and modeling on our part, a lot of guessing. It took us about two or three years to pull it all together, and we did it. But So we learned from that. We don't want to do this again. We, we, we just don't want to do this again. This is... This is an unsustainable situation. So a couple things that, that we did is, is we found out from that exercise that, that you really need an, an early warning system. So you need, first, well, first and foremost, and your highest priority is going to be that you need to have good erosion control. You need to have better than the normal. You need to have the double high hazard silt fence. You have to have silt fence along your lake front as a double protection. You need to have larger sediment basins. You need to have construction people, contractors, that know a little bit about sediment and erosion control so if they see a problem, they can fix it before it causes a water quality issue downstream. So you need to have good, solid erosion control on site. That's your first line of defense, and that's something we focus real, real hard on. And then second, 
is that you need to have an early warning detection system. And that's what we use those automated water quality monitoring units for. You know, you use telemetry, it tells us when you've got a lot of mud coming down <coughs> the, the river or the creek, and mud equals probably a failed erosion control measure. So that means we can get upstream, get that measure fixed before it fills in the code. So, you know, you have to keep the sediment on site as your first priority, your second priority. If it leaves the site, you need to find out about it quick so you can get up there to the site and, and fix the measure to keep it on the site. And kind of the third priority and kind of the last measure is your bathymetry. And quite honestly, you know, we're, we are learning a lot about bathymetry. Uh, we don't, uh, here, here's an example. So all codes are filling in to some extent naturally. That's just, that's just nature, they will. So how, how much of what's in that code is natural? and how much is in there because of poor erosion control? Mm -hmm. How much is in the code because the channel is just eroding? Or how much of what's in the code came off the construction site? <laughs> so you really got to have a good handle and a good understanding of, of sedimentation and how it, how it uh, affects a code before that bathymetry data is really of, of, great, of great value. And that's what we're doing with Davidson College right now. We're trying to get a better understanding of that. We're not giving up on bathymetry. We're still requiring bathymetry and we're still using bathymetry. We, we think it's valuable, but we hope to be able to fine tune what we're doing and come up with a better program. And I think that's where y'all may be able to gain a little bit of information because we're going to, what we see over there is what y'all want to see over here. We've got similar soils, a lot of similar conditions. Um, you can see there I put the cost. You know, you've got about a 25% a, a increase and costs for your erosion, enhanced erosion control measures. Um, the benefits, you obviously, you're going to have better protected drinking water supplies downstream, not just yours, but others as well. And you're also going to be able to have enhanced quality of your, of your recreational areas, keeping that mud away. And th this is my last slide. I go back kind of to the beginning where, you know, that river divides us, but in many respects, it joins us because what y'all do to the river, you do to us. And what we do to the river, we do to you because we all share that water. And we are intimately aware of that. And so it doesn't really divide us, it brings us together. So I'm here today more than anything else just to offer our help in going forward if you have any questions. And I wanted you to meet Olivia because I, if you are so inclined, I would like for her to come back if you want and share with you what we've learned through our COVID assessment and protection program to see if you're interested in any of that. But I, I guess I'll just end with this, that all the communities along the Catawba are growing, they're growing fast. And a lot of that growth is, ha is happening in areas that drain to the Catawba. We can't let that river go. We got to protect it. I mean, we can't live without it. I mean, we ruin our drinking water supplies. We've really done something. And you tend to think that science will fix everything. There's a lot of technology that can remove a lot of pollutants from, from waterways prior to distributing them out to the public for drinking. Some pollutants you can't remove. And as technology improves, as a matter of fact, what we're finding there are pollutants in the part per, B, parts per billion range we never even knew existed that are that are thought to be known carcinogens now. And the other, the other side of the coin, too, is that, yeah, you can remove them, but it is expensive. God, it's expensive. It's expensive to treat water. And if you have to put in more of that science, more of that technology, then your costs are going to go up, costs to your customers are going to go up, and that is enough to drive businesses away. That's happened in a lot of communities, that their cost for their utilities has gone so high because the quality of their source water is so bad that companies will go to areas that have lower utility rates, particularly if it's a company that uses a lot of water. So there are all kinds of reasons to, to protect the lake. And, you know, I, I became bundly aware of kind of where things were going. With, we've issued, like, no swimming advisories. We've issued four so far this, this, this year, this swimming season. And if you look at Facebook and some of the Twitter chatter, you're hearing people say, that water's nasty, and I wouldn't swim in that water. And we kind of take it for granted that that lake is really clean. But two, it's a perception. If people think 
the lake isn't clean. And people quit wanting to live along the lake and recreate in the lake, then that's going to affect the bottom line for our, a lot of our economies around the area. So that's, that's all I had to say and, unless somebody has a question. I have a question. First of all, I sound probably more obstinate than the other people maybe here because I live on Lake Wiley, and so I'm acutely aware of a lot of this. And so when we talked about the gentleman who came to speak to us earlier um, about our development, we were told a number of different things, and so I'm trying to get clarity. One thing I would like to request, though, if it's possible, when you have a no-swimming advisory, could there be buoys put up? In other words, I was in Paul Creek Saturday. I did not know, not literally got on my jet ski. And so I did not know that there's a no swimming advisory until I visited the people where I was. And they were actually going out in their boat telling people to go away. So is there a possibility, because you guys have people patrolling, that they could put buoys up? Because that's a concern. Yeah, we got, we got the buoys up. It was Saturday afternoon. Okay. And we put them up at the beginning of the code. See, that, that spiel that happened, apparently it... The, a construction a contractor busted sewer mm -hmm. on Friday. They didn't tell Charlotte Water, the utility provider of across the river, that until Saturday. We didn't find out until Saturday before noon. Okay. And when we found out about it, we scrambled. We got buoys oh. out. You know, we did. We've got a Charmec alert. We can right. send out texts and all that stuff. A lot so of technology. I, I apologize, and I evidently beat the buoys, but the people, the whatever advisory you called out, these people knew about. So yeah. good. I'm glad to know that because that really concerned me. Yeah, we've got buoys out there now, and they'll stay up. What we do is we're going to monitor that code until the, it's really an E. coli that we look at. But mm -hmm. when the E. coli levels drop to the normal range, and we'll pull the buoys up. Okay. Right now, they're they're very elevated, which is what we would expect with 800,000 gallons of sewage. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Anybody have any other questions for Rusty? I had one. Is that the, I'm not a scientist, but the bathomology, the bathometric. <laughs> uh, so if, if, if we don't have a good handle on how it all works, how, how does it apply that to somebody as a rule? Yeah. Because um, I, I felt like you did a, a fairly decent job of applying some stricter rules to this most recent development. And a lot of their pushback was, well, who has the answers to that's yeah. a fair concern. The, so I was just kind of curious. How, how do you see us proceeding? Yeah, I, I think y'all did a good job. Um, I heard you you didn't you didn't require the bathymetry, mm -hmm. but I think yeah. that the consultant brought up some points. Like there are other developers draining into this code. Mm -hmm. Maybe I think that was one point. That's a very valid point. Um, and if it would have been in Mecklenburg, we probably would have required bathymetry. But y'all not knowing and ever having done it before, there was wisdom in what you did. So, so to answer your question, how do we use it? So we require that the developer go out there and they take bathymetry measurements before they uncover, uncover the first piece of dirt. And then we require that they go out there annually every year afterwards until one year after construction. Mm -hmm. And they do the same bathymetry analysis. And they provide us with the data. And we see if there's been a lot of fluctuation in the bottom over the years. Now, the, the tricky part of it is codes under natural condition will fluctuate their bottoms over, over the years. In other words, you may have a shallow spot here one year. The next year, due to just currents or whatever, it may get deeper and another part may get... So it's that's what's the tricky part. But it can be done because overall what you can do is, is you can kind of balance it all out. And you can see if, the, if there is a gross increase in the amount of sediment or increase in the bottom level and can kind of tell you whether there's been any sediment deposition. So once you see evidence of that sediment deposition, the other thing the bathymetry lets you do is to target areas for dredging. If you don't know what the bottom level was like before construction, you can't hardly require them. You don't know what to require them to dredge. That's right. So the bathymetry mm -hmm. allows you to identify that. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of the bathymetry. But when I said earlier, the priority, your first priority is what y'all did. You tried to make sure they had good erosion control measures to keep it out of the code and then an early warning system so that if something mm -hmm. failed, you get out there and get it fixed. So that's, yeah. you did the high priority stuff. The <coughs> bathymetry, so what we're gonna learn, it's not just bathymetry alone. So you gotta go out there and you gotta take sediment cores and you gotta know what you're looking for because 
for example, the color of the soil, the texture of the soil can tell you when that soil was deposited. So you know about some of these areas of sediment move around. We're learning all that through this professor at Davidson University. Um, so we're hoping to fine tune how we can use that data to be even more exacting when we're having codes ready. Does that answer your question? It does. It sounds to me that, I mean, I was appreciate your presentation and I was at your presentation before the Gaston County Board of Commissioners a few months ago as well. Um, you know, I think realistically we need to figure out, because as you said, you, you have a staff of 30 people. You know, I, I don't think that's realistic for us, probably not for, for Gaston County. Um, you know, what, what's the best use, you know, what, what can we do with the, re, with the resources we realistically have to make the most impact? I like, you know, the, the county might disagree, but I, I, I do like your, your thoughts about perhaps delegating to the county who would have more resources than us to do some of these things. And certainly having been at the county commissioner's meeting, they seemed uh, mostly receptive to um, moving along the lines that you suggested. So, you know, I think we can work in tandem with, with the county on that. And, you know, I just think it would be uh, more efficient for us to rely on, on the county perhaps than um, trying to come up with, with some of these new positions because the county will have um, more resources. So I just think, and I'd also be interested to see what like Davidson and Mount Hill do because it seems like, you know, I, I mean, certainly Davidson has similar issues and, and uh, concerns as we do in terms of both resources and development. And so I'd be interested in seeing what, what they do in terms of their local program. But those, that's sort of my thoughts on, on this. I think it's all good, but I just wanna, you know, like you said, we're pro we probably not are going to have the resources available that you do. So we just need to figure out how to use the resources we have um, in the most intelligent manner to do the most good. I would, I would agree with that as far as using the county. I think with this last development, we cut about the best deal that we were gonna get. Um, but I do agree that doing a bathymetric survey, you've gotta have a benchmark. You have to have some point that you can reference later on. Now, I mean, there was pushback on that because it was some degree of it's not us, it's them, you know. And we're gonna to continue to see that argument until we standardize our codes. Um, I don't wanna do this ad hoc every time we have a development along the river. So, you know, we need to hit the pause button and maybe come up, this is the protocol and these are our standards and this is across the board and you have to meet these. Mm -hmm. um, this was a really us putting our toe in the water for the first time. So to speak. Yeah. Not, not to, um, but uh, I, I do like some of the things that you said today. I think it's on us now to take yeah. that information and develop a policy. Yeah. We, in conjunction with the county, I think, because yeah. it sounds like they're moving in the same, they at least seem receptive to moving in the same direction. And I guess we'll hear from, from the county in just a minute. Um, and I think we should, you know, sooner, it would be, probably be good to do it sooner rather than later. Um, because we've got two thirds of that, I, I guess you call it the Pittenger property, just for, you know, but it, that may or may not be vacant long. So, you know, you'd rather have it in place going forward um, for exactly the reasons Richard said. How do you guys handle, like, um, in situations that were just described where you've got multiple development kind of contributing to uh, sediment accumulation? Code. We've had that problem too, where you've got multiple developers in the same watershed, both contributing sediment to the same code. And we've done cost shares. <clears throat> As I said, the, the dredge we did on Brown's Code did a cost share based on the number of acres disturbed and the length of time of that disturbance. And people paid their share. That's that stuff's hard to do. I mean, I, I mean we've we've done that a lot. Um, we, over the years, enter into contracts with developers, sometimes multiple developers, to, they pay us to do the bathymetry, so that helps us out with our budget. 
and it also gives us the data we need to protect the code. There, there's a lot of creative things you can you can do along those lines. And, and if you've got one developer upstream and another one downstream, you can put automated monitoring between the two and look at the data to see which one is the contributor. There's a lot of different techniques you can use. Uh, but again, you, you have to have the resources, and I, I know that's that's a challenge. So, I, I mean, I'm just here today just to share with you some of the things we've learned. And again, uh, all you need to do is ask us. We'll, we'd love to help you in any way we can. Yeah, well, I, I definitely think we should take them up on their offer to learn more about that code production program. Um, I, I'm definitely interested in learning more about that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very Thank much. Thank you. Appreciate it. As, as uh, Mike knows, Rusty, as Mike knows. He's doing great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So our final speaker on this topic tonight is Jenna Goodman. Uh, she's a native of Gaston County and is the Flood and Watershed Administra Administrator and GIS Manager for Gaston County with 26 years of experience within municipal and county government. Ms. Goodman holds multiple certifications of those are floodplain management and stormwater management. So we'd like to invite her up here to share a little bit about the um, tasks and actions that are taking place at the Gaston County level. Yeah. And thank you for having me. Um, I'm not, I can go in depth to what uh, Gaston County's ordinances are, but I think I'm not going to go through the whole what sediment is, how we remove it. But our stormwater and erosion control programs managed by the Department of Natural Resources out of our Dallas office. Uh, They're managed by the, of course, adoption of the state model ordinance for both stormwater control and a separate ordinance for the erosion and sediment control ordinance. Typically for our erosion and sediment control, all land disturbing activity that encumbers or disturbs an acre or more is required to submit a soil and erosion sedimentation control plan review at least 30 days prior to the initial uh, disturbance of that project. What the county has begun looking at is uh, looking at all of our programs to see which ones we could pull <coughs> higher regulations into. Now when doing that and you start messing with like Rusty alluded to the actual ordinances then you have to send those to the state and they have to get adopted for those higher regulations. The goal for us was we were trying to keep in mind that we don't want to hinder development unnecessarily, that we understand, you know, the diverse community and from the type of development wanted to the type of people you want you to have in your community. But to find a happy medium that would serve as many of the agendas as possible while keeping all of the towns, the city, and the county on an even playing field with regards to development. So when looking at the guidelines for construction, we also looked at possibly creating a maintenance and enforcement program for post-construction. But the overall plan that we're looking at right now is to create a waterfront overlay district. Uh, this district would have enhanced measures to protect our waterways. Uh, the overlay would need to be adopted by all municipalities that would be affected. Um, those local municipalities that have staff that already enforce their stormwater or erosion control, we would ask that they continue to enforce those higher regulations in the overlay. However, there are several that we have interlocal agreements with that we would just have those towns or cities uh, change those uh, interlocals to where the county would come in and enforce them. Do you, which one is, where does Belmont fall in with the interlocal? I don't think we have an interlocal okay. uh, agreement. Do you have it for just soil and erosion? So 
in that event, then you, to, if, if this uh, plan takes place and we are able to do this with the higher regulations, then you come in and you're still on a zero reference. Um, we're in discussion with David Owens with the School of Government on what would and would not be allowed within those, uh, the overlay district. Um, we currently have the overlay in our UDO, so it would be actually just enacting it. So where we are right now, um, we've had several interlocal or interdepartmental staff meetings that we've discussed different ordinances. Um, and then we've had our first multi-jurisdictional meeting that was held, I guess, last week uh, with all the municipalities that were able to come. Uh, the groups focusing on what are the important factors you see, what would you like in this overlay district if, if you feel there is a need for higher regulations, what would those be? Um, we do anticipate to have a few more meetings before we start presenting anything publicly. Uh, we really just want to got things started, but we'd rather be slow and right than have to come back, you know, later and for things to, to correct. But our current overlay district reads as follows. This waterfront overlay district is hereby established to provide supplemental restrictions to protect and enhance water quality, public safety, and public recreational opportunities of the Catawba River and its impoundments. This dis district shall cover surface waters of the Catawba River and its impoundments in all land areas within a thousand feet of these shorelines. The shorelines be deemed to be the high water mark at the 570 contour line level for Lake Wiley of the Catawba River. So that's what our current overlay district reads. Any other questions, or I'll be glad to answer anything I can. Are those measures that was so bad, so we're <laughs> not going to change. Currently, Systemic tree, <laughs> We did not do the, uh, the bare metal survey. We did do the high hazard hill sampling. That will be a requirement. Uh, larger setting spacing, extensive ground cover to remain intact. Uh, seeding disturbed areas. Uh, right now, we didn't do a time. They had a five to seven day. Limiting as much ground disturbance near lakes and streams. We're also looking at this as our 303B stream, any impaired stream, um, and also looking at putting bunkers along those. We have, unfortunately, several of those in the county. Um, and then lastly, maintaining the riparian buffers while creating more natural passage for fish. That's where we're at right now. Why, why were bathymetric measures not included? Were they not suggested, or was there pushback? It was suggested, but we currently do not have the staff to delve into that type of data and what it would entail along the same lines with the turbidity monitoring. You're going to have to have someone to monitor that. Now, we did kind of speak loosely about possibly having money provided to the Riverkeeper Foundation to so they could purchase additional monitoring. Um, we have it. Exclusively talking to Brandon about that, but that's, you know, someone's eventually going to have to take over monitoring. Um, and the best fit seems like. So, uh, hypothetically, let's just say Belmont wanted to go ahead and join this, this UDO overlay. <coughs> how, how would it work if we decide to go a step beyond on our own and include bathymetric? I mean, we, we, we can still, of course, do that, I would guess. But if you don't have the staff to do that, I think I understood that we could go with Mecklenburg County to handle some of this. Yeah, you could, uh, as far as the back metric work, sale, the higher hazard, whoever the land developer is, the higher hazard, have them pay to have it done. Then you would have to have somebody to review the data. And that could be done, it's not that hard to do, it doesn't take that long. So that probably could be somebody. Right now, you
Okay, so that sounds like it works kind of like our TIA then, traffic impact analysis, as we just farm that out to a firm that specializes in it. Yeah. There are many ways to do it, and it has to be called from the land trust first. That's one way to do it. You just, the way you just, and in most cases, they're, they're willing to pay it because they're getting a lot for it. They're getting protection in the water. They just, they're just using the water to keep the people from killing themselves. So they want to pay for it too. I agree. I think we should spend some time just talking about this amongst ourselves and see what direction we want to go in. Anybody have any other questions for Megan? Good. Thank you, Megan. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate that. So again, this was just an introduction to this discussion. Um, give you a little bit more information about you know, what we've done since the Dale Webb rezoning, working with Mecklenburg County and Gaston County and stakeholders. So this is just a, you know, the beginning of this process. We don't have the answers for you. Uh, our staff, Hayden and, and Peyton, are working with Gaston County on that group to look at what the ordinances could be, what the overlay district, and it sounds like we, we, we may be able to do something similar to Mecklenburg County where you've got the countywide ordinances, the overlays you know, specific for the South Fork and Catawba, and we may want to enhance it through conditional zoning like Mecklenburg County mm -hmm. does, where the cities within Mecklenburg County uh, do on a case-by-case -case basis where it makes sense. So we're still learning all of this. And just while they're here, I want to thank Rusty and Jenna and, and your staff uh, for all your help and conversations during that Dell Web rezoning for us. So we learn a lot and we appreciate it. Okay, so staff will just continue working with Gaston County, reach out to uh, Mecklenburg County, uh, maybe Ms. Edwards, if you'd like you to come and meet with our staff and let us dig in and get a little more information about some of the uh, items that are still outstanding and then we'll report back when appropriate with, to council. Well, did, did Ryan, do you want, I mean, when you say we need to discuss among ourselves, did you mean well, like- we, I thought we were discussing how we want to move forward. Yeah, <laughs> and did you mean like that now? Or, yeah, okay. that's yes. sort of how I interpreted it. Okay, yeah, So if you could give us direction on, on what we need to bring to the table with the county. Mm -hmm. Please well, let us know. I, it sounds like the county's moving at a different speed than we want to move at, because we're the ones that have the developments coming to town. So my thought would be that we move at our pace yeah. and put together our policies. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And yeah. if we can leverage the county, fantastic. It sounds like Mecklenburg's prepared to go now and help us with some staffing. And okay. I think the standards that we set with the Dell Web development um, are acceptable for yeah. for everybody coming forward. And that's what my understanding. What about the bathymetry? I think that would be something we need to shake out as part of this process. Mm -hmm. I think it comes down to if there's a quantifiable way to enforce it. Yeah. <laughs> Which, or at least figure out who's responsible for what. Yes, because yeah. that's where it needs to be fair. And I think having yeah. the burden fall on the developer is certainly reasonable in this situation. Yeah, yeah I kind of like what Mecklenburg County is doing with it. It sounds like, I of mean, course. they don't have it completely figured out, but um, it sounds like they're uh, moving in a the right direction and I think pushing the cost on the development and I makes a lot of sense. I guess you would have to determine too whether somebody's building a single family home on a lot versus a bigger development, but I'm sure we can you guys can handle that. But the compounding difference on the larger development would be more negatively impacted on the older buildings than the older home. Yeah, I mean somebody building on a one acre lot. Yeah, it's not yeah. Gonna be as bad yeah. as somebody else. Yeah, eight hundred <laughs> acres. Yeah, yeah, but I think that would fall underneath our small development plan versus large plan, but yeah. But that, I think I'd like to start seeing some stuff coming back on this. Well, we've, we've got a lot of land that's gonna be coming up for development. So if we're gonna do it, we need to go ahead and do it because otherwise people are gonna get in under the wire. We're gonna pass something and it's not gonna to apply to them. Yeah, yep. I, I agree. agree. And then we'll just be back in the situation we were a few weeks ago. We gotta, you know, negotiate everything line they by line. They were as cooperative as I think we we could we can expect. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even though the bath bathymetric survey may not be an exact science, I mean, I do like it because it gives you some reference point. You know, <laughs> we were at this level. Um, the cost sharing that you put into it is a good idea because I mean, 
you figure out some sort of percentage as fair as you can be for whatever the contributing factors are, and that's the best you can hope for. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think you have to have some data that tells you where we started from and where we are now. Like your projections show on Brown Cove, I mean, the thing about living on the lake is being able to access the lake, and if you can't get your boat in the water, and then yeah, well, I mean, you can the go attraction? down the South Fork now and see docks that are just surrounded by mud. I mean, if I was the homeowner there, I'd be very upset about that. I would imagine Kramer could probably follow suit. We are very interested in pursuing, but we can only hope Mount Holly could follow in the future. It seems like a good opportunity for us to take the lead on this. You know, yeah. Everybody else needs to catch up. That's fine with me. Yeah. Yeah. We, Maybe they'll have some better ideas. We can add them on later. Yeah. 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 When we talk about leadership and leading, this is a great opportunity to set the bar for Gaston County. Mm. We don't just set the bar. We are the bar. <laughs> <laughs> now do you have direction? Yes. So, this is, so, it's, it's, so we can obviously do things through conditional zoning right. like, like we did. Yeah. Um, and it, it may be that, and as I mentioned in my report to you on Friday, we've got some interest in some lakefront and riverfront mm -hmm. properties um, that probably would happen prior to updating the county ordinance. Yeah. May, maybe, maybe not. We don't know. But there may be a, a zoning overlay ordinance that we could also do that would that would See use wondering. that would use some of the language from Mecklenburg County and Gaston County, so that we would have our own program. But, but again, we would need help with the county to administer it. So through our interlocal agreements with the county. So maybe that we could work on kind of a two-step thing of enhancing our zoning ordinance and land development code, as well as using the conditional zoning as a, as additional tools. And you know, you you can see what it's like to be a lawyer now, because obviously we'd like that as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah. well, I, think it's, I think the Dell web gives you a template. Yes. Um, yeah. This is it's, what what developers can expect of their experience of dealing with us. Yeah, so, I think we've actually already done a lot of the groundwork. It's yeah. just kind of a matter of it, codifying it. it. Yeah, putting it in the right the right ordinance, and, and mm -hmm. it sounds like there's probably some good examples across the river that can, we can work on that. And then, of course, uh, we'd have to draft that as staff and, and make sure that the state's okay with it. And then that's a text amendment, so it goes to the planning board mm -hmm. and then back to the council. So it's not... We won't have it for you at your August 2nd meeting. There, there's a whole process that we have to follow, but certainly this will be a priority for us. Good. Well, thanks for all your work. And, and then just remember, we do have the, uh, the large projects that are going through. They will all be conditional zoning, so we have this interim tool while we're yeah. prepping the actual overlay ordinance and coordinating uh, the implementation of that ordinance as well. And I'm sure we can work with our friends in Cranbourne for some help as well. All right, thank you. Well, I mean, to, you, to, to that, I would just say I, do, I still would say time is of the essence. I mean, we we need some verbiage. I mean, whether you know, I would like to get something on paper because you can always modify something if you have to. But say this this is a line in the sand. Get it on paper. Get it codified, and then if you need to, you can always go back and modify it. But I do think, I mean, we're looking at a lot of development on the water. I mean, you know, there was some issue about apartments downtown. You know, next thing you know, before we can pass our ordinance or regulation, we, we're going to potentially could see apartments downtown. So in this scenario, I don't, I don't want to see that play out again if we can avoid it. That moves us on to the next item on the agenda, American Rescue Plan update. Adrian? Thank you. Thank you, guests. You're welcome to stay, and you're also welcome to, to leave. <laughs> so our next presentation are our all-star interns, Morgan Abernathy and Ryan Krupa. Uh, we'll give you a, a brief update on the American Rescue Plan. <laughs> Good evening, Council. I'm Morgan Abernathy. So we have some guidance from the Department of Treasury. They have provided generous funding with no strings attached. We have watched numerous webinars, read through the interim final rule, and read through the latest compliance and reporting guidelines. 
We'll be happy to answer any questions you may have at the end of our presentation. So you said no strings attached. No strings attached. All right. Just want to make sure I heard that correctly. <laughs> The American Rescue Plan provides a total of $350 billion in coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds. Local governments will receive funds in two tranches. We will receive a total of $3.67 million. 50% is expected to be delivered this year, and the balance will be delivered roughly 12 months later. Recipients have flexibility in which categories to use eligible funding. All categories besides infrastructure must be connected to to the effects of COVID-19. It sounds like strings. <laughs> the first ARP category allows for supporting public health response through forms of mitigation, behavioral health care, and increased public health resources. The interim final rule lists examples as vaccination programs, PPE purchases, and ventilation improvements. Behavioral health care includes mental health treatment, substance misuse treatment, and crisis intervention. Eligible uses under this category must be in response to the disease itself or the harmful consequences of the economic disruptions resulting from or exacerbated by the COVID-19 public health emergency. Assistance to unemployed workers, small businesses, and nonprofits would respond directly to the economic or financial harms resulting from and or exacerbated by the public health emergency. Recipients may use funds to replace lost revenue. Revenue loss compares actual pandemic era revenue to an estimate of revenue had the pandemic not occurred. Loss of revenue can be calculated by the formula provided by the interim final rule or assuming 4.1% growth, whichever is higher. Recipients may provide premium pay to eligible workers performing essential work. The interim final rule defines eligible workers as workers who have been and continue to be relied on to maintain continuity of operations of essential critical infrastructure sectors, including those who are critical to protecting the health and well-being of their communities. Eligible workers include staff at nursing homes, hospitals, child care workers, janitors and sanitation workers, truck drivers, social services, and human services staff. ARP provides funds to make necessary investments in water and sewer infrastructure. The interim final rule aligns eligibility through the Environmental Protection Agency, Clean Water State Revolving Fund, and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. This combination allows for flexibility to respond to needs of the community. Project examples include improvements to infrastructure such as building or upgrading facilities and transmission, distribution, and storage systems. Funding may also be used for wastewater infrastructure projects, such as constructing publicly owned treatment infrastructure, managing and treating stormwater or subsurface drainage water, facilitating water reuse, and securing publicly owned treatment works. Lastly, eligible investments in broadband are those designed to provide services meeting adequate speeds and are provided to unserved and underserved households and businesses. Recipients are encouraged to build broadband delivering reliable speeds and are encouraged to pursue fiber optic investments. Federally, local governments may spend money on broadband. However, North Carolina does not allow local governments to provide broadband services. And with that, Ryan will be speaking on ineligible uses and some suggestions. All right, so we have more strings. You cannot, <laughs> you cannot use the ARP funding to offset reductions in tax revenue, pay for pension funds, pay for debt service, pay for settlements or judgments from wherever they may come from, supply a rainy day fund, or match non-federal grants for funding purposes. Even more strings, you have to report annually. This will begin after we get our October 31st this year, and we'll cover the period from the time we get it until September. It's on October 31st, every year after. By 2024, the funds must be obligated, and they must be spent by 2026. Uh, five years after the funds are expended, we have to keep records. So if you were to expend in 2026, it would be until 2030. Some recommendations that we could do with qualified projects right now. We could complete the North Belmont Booster Pump Station. It falls within water and sewer improvement, also falls within a qualified census tract. 
to be helping a disadvantaged community that was hit by COVID-19. We could use it to pay for grants to fund nonprofits that'll help the economy recover. Mont Cross Emerge and GBA have already been approved by you guys. Additionally, you could give the DBDA $50,000 to pay for programs to help restart the tourism industry. You can also focus on Main Street programs and other activities that would help bring tourism back to Belmont to recover from the pandemic. And with that, uh, the other thing is be patient. The state has their own set of money that they plan to grant out for different categories. These are some examples they have on their website, but they've yet to get specific about the requirements or what exactly they'd be looking for. Uh, additionally, Treasury has not actually issued the final ruling yet. We're still working on the interim ruling. We don't know when they're going to issue it. They've been saying they're going to for a while. So when that finally comes out, it'll give us more clarity on what's eligible and what isn't. And then the League of Municipalities and Central Line recommend leveraging state and federal ARP fundings in combination with our own to make the best use of the money that's being given. Can I ask you a question? Yes, that's what we're here for. So <laughs> you said be patient. And you're, you're suggesting that because before we start allocating dollars, find out which kind of people we want? Yeah, they're setting up grant programs as well as the federal government. And we don't really have details on what the grants are for, just kind of some broad categories. So we wouldn't want to obligate funds and then have them offer to give us funds for the same project, so essentially. More, more yeah, and then the suggestions there are just some things that we could do that are qualified projects. You start coming up with ideas, just spell them. Right. Okay. And there's no rush. You don't have to obligate till 2021. Right. So do we have the money yet? Or um, I know we had originally <laughs> said by the end of June, we're now looking at the end of July. When, when is the money actually going to be here? The check Where's the my mail? check? Last I heard was by the end of August. So <laughs> originally, originally they said June. The state decided that they didn't want to distribute it before the new fiscal year because it would complicate the budget process. So they decided to wait till the new fiscal year. I don't know what the holdup is now, but by the end of August is the last thing I've heard. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I um, sort of thought about some things. I'm, and, and you covered what I know we had already discussed, things like the booster pump station and um, the money that we uh, had uh, said we were going to give to to Mont Cross and um, uh, the GBA at the last month's workshop. I guess we wanted to come out from under that, um, and I think it's you know the DBDA is another uh, good idea um, to to come from this money. Um, I know of one other thing we receive some communications about is, is the water and sewer infrastructure to some, you know, to be determined at, at Dixon Village, there was a request from, from Habitat uh, about that. Um, and I think you said draft up a proposal. Um, so um, we'll see, but that might be another good use of some of the funds um, to, to assist with that project. And then we can put our thinking caps on. All jokes aside though, it is very flexible. The final rule will hopefully provide more clarity on that. And so this is a good opportunity to really take some federal funds and make some improvements. Because it, again, jokes aside, there are minimal strings attached. It's just reporting and then a handful of things you can't do. Yeah. Yeah, th this is sort of the opposite of what we normally get with federal funding, where they give you all the rules and you determine if you're eligible or not. Now they give you guidelines and you determine if your project's eligible. And you just have to be able to defend it, you know, five years from now when we get audited on it. Uh, but the Treasury is not going to pre-clear, pre-approve, or pre-certify projects. So uh, we've got a list of, of infrastructure projects that are allowable by the two different uh, state revolving funds and the EPA guidance. And as long as you meet one of those, then you should be eligible. Uh, so that's a lot of the water, the sewer, and the stormwater projects. And you know, to Ryan's point about being uh, patient with it, the governor has a plan, the House has a plan, and the state Senate has a plan of how they want to spend the state's allotment of all of this. And it's just incredible amounts of money going into the infrastructure components of it. So it could be that something like Dixon Village, you, know, you could use the state's allotment of the ARP funding so that we don't have to use the cities. So we, we want to make sure that, that we can use as much money as possible, uh, but maybe we could leverage some of ours with some state funding. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's any way to use some of it for this rec center, that might be a good idea. Um, very helpful. I, I'm just, you know, kicking around some ideas in my head, you know, with the 
I don't know how you could quantify a price inflation as an economic impact from a pandemic, and or I saw something up there about public health. Um, I mean, we are going to have like courts and exercising and stuff in there. I don't know, um, but you know, just as a a wish list item, I guess for me. I think we're going to get a lot of wish list and request because there's no strings attached. I mean, me personally, I like tangible items. We've talked about broadband for a long time. I don't know that we've really made any movement or progress on that. I mean, the case can be made that's good for the public and private sector. And our, and our water and sewer, I mean, those are two tangible items that, have, that reach out and touch a lot of people. There, there is some discussion on changing the state law on broadband. Right yeah. now, we're we're precluded from using yeah, that's right. anything on broadband. What's the cost of North Carolina Constitution? Six hundred and seventy-five. Six seventy-five is what's in the CFP. Does, does that apply to the Wi-Fi that we have downtown? Like, if we wanted to upgrade that, we could upgrade. I believe we could upgrade the downtown Wi-Fi. We just can't use any city fiber. We couldn't. Okay. So some towns wanted to. They've got you know a fiber ring around the city, and they only use a certain percentage of their capacity, and they would like to lease unused capacity to say Time Warner to provide broadband service to an underserved area. We're not allowed to do that. Okay. Would the North Belmont Fire Station qualify for this or not? That's the a public good question. Station, do you, I don't think that would qualify. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, the issue with pretty much anything that's not infrastructure is you have to ultimately relate it back to COVID. That's mm -hmm. what the audit's gonna look for. And so if there's a justifiable connection between delays or if it did somehow was well, caused well, by COVID, you could- uh... <laughs> Well, but I mean, hasn't the president adopted an exceedingly broad definition of infrastructure? Not in this particular there's case. There's a lot of- Firemen are yeah. infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah, there, a lot of people have asked uh, sidewalks, roads, uh, water, sewer, broadband are the three that they highlight as like good to go. Well, so all this money floating around, thank God there's no inflation or anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, when will we know the state's restrictions or when they will be handing out some of the money and for what? Most likely when we have a, uh, a signed state budget. So which we yeah. haven't had in several years. <laughs> so when, when Cause right, cause the state senate has tied the ARP funding to the budget, and we'll see where that stands as, as the house provides its budget and whether the governor is going to sign it and whether it can be overridden if it's vetoed. Lots of fun. Yes. Is that a question for Ron and Morgan? No. Thank you. Thank Good you. job. Thank you. Thank you. Did a great job. Thank you. All right, next item on the agenda, to instead of the approval of a resolution authorizing a two-year funding for the governor's highway safety program grant. They could ask Chief Hawkins to come up and, and provide a very brief overview of this it's resolution. So two-year or year two? Year two. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Mayor Council, this is actually just uh, housekeeping. We have to sign this resolution if we want to continue to stay involved in the grant, receive their money. So I was just asked that city approves resolution so we can get it to them because if not they won't write us a check. I make a motion to approve the resolution. I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. That was easy. That, that was brief. Money. Thank you. <laughs> that was a simple one. <laughs> you can have five minutes on the next <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Thank you for approving that. So we'll move on to the next item, um, which is the discussion uh, of the ABC police officer. Discussion on the ABC, uh, of, uh, ABC police officer. I'm going to ask Chief Hawkins to present this the proposal, and he's been in discussions with the ABC board about this. Yes, sir. Mayor, Council, I've been uh, in discussions with the ABC board for some time on this, and as you know, the ABC board is, um, they have to give us restricted funds that goes for education and then there's a, a non-restricted fund that, that they give us and we have done very well and obviously by the um, amount of money they make that is a percentage that they have to give specifically to law um, I know this is 
not typical in government, but we are getting to a point with some of the educational funds that we're not going to be able to spend that money <laughs> because it is restricted. Uh, when the funds are restricted, when we budget your old fund, that doesn't mean it goes into the general fund of the city. That means that we have to continue that fund. So um, what I'm asking is that we do a, a full-time ABC enforcement officer because there's a lot more to it than just enforcement. And just to give a little background, I'm going to try to make it as brief as possible. But the city is responsible, um, you know, for obviously enforcing all the laws of the, of the city and the city rules. The ABC board is, um, you know, responsible for providing the city funds. Every bottle of liquor that you see has a stamp on it. And that stamp means that it comes from the ABC store of that municipality. Or that city or this part, the closest one. So right now what happens is we're kind of in a proactive state because we don't have the manpower to, to go around and do the inspections to make sure that all the stamps are coming from the Belmont ABC store. And if they're not, they're going somewhere else to purchase alcohol, we're losing revenue. The ABC store is uh, losing revenue. That's one uh, piece of it. We have, I think it was close to 60 alcohol establishments in the city of Belmont that mean from grocery stores stores, restaurants, and that is continuing to grow. I think um, to be responsible, we need to make sure that we're being proactive, we're doing inspections, we're checking the stamps, but then there's the education piece. Um, we go into the schools, we educate the children on the effects of, of alcohol and drunk driving and reckless parents. Um, we even have a golf bar at the Federal Vision Golf Center. But another piece of that is we're responsible when we have events to educate event staff on the barriers and where people can go and how to monitor all that stuff. Right. We need someone that specializes in that. We need someone that can, can really be ultimately responsible for, for taking all that on working with the ABC board. And I just think that at this point, the funds that they give us, um, which were projected close to $40,000 that they're going to be paying to us this year, I think they paid, they paid around that last year, so I think it should be more based on I think it's a good investment for the for the city to add this staff basically um, with them funding the majority of the cost it should be offset by really the um, our benefits which I'm somewhere in the neighborhood of about fifteen thousand dollars or so. So I think that and that could be less depending on if we get more funds from them. And right now it has been way more than we projected to give us as, as the police department and the community. So just through uh, talks with the ABC board um, with uh, Adrian and some brief conversations. I think it would be uh, beneficial as if they're going to offset most of the calls. This, uh, this person, since it's not a grant position, they will actually be available to us that they could do any kind of task, but their primary responsibility would be for our for our city to make sure that we stay on top of, you know, because we're responsible for the safety. We have a very vibrant city. The last thing we want to do is have alcohol establishments right. and the more time we spend at them the more that we have with them we're going to make sure people are, are in check even to make sure that they separate the trash you know the bottles and, and the trash there's a lot to that but and you may say well that's what alcohol law enforcement is for yes they work for the state and they're extremely short-handed so if we need assistance we can call them and you know they they've been they they help us on major issues but i think that the city of belmont and we're going to have this many establishments to continue. We need to be responsible and we need to make sure that we stay on top of this to ensure the safety of our citizens, number one, and also to, to protect the investment that we have to make sure people are actually purchasing the goods from the proper place. So I would, I would request this position to the city offset the cost of you know, the difference. And I, I know that the city receives funds outside of what we receive. Well compensated for this this position. Okay. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Chief? Is this something that we can add to an existing position? We we don't have the manpower to, to stay on top of this like we we need to. That's the problem is we do it now, but we don't do it very effective. This is a deficiency that we have is you know we're like I said, we're being very proactive. Right now it's Detective Sergeant, who has about 30 other responsibilities, that's having to go out here and try to, to maintain.
maintain this. So basically what we get is when we get an opportunity or if we get an issue, we do a deal with it. And I don't like to do this kind of thing. I like to be very proactive. Chief, what? I'm sorry. Do you have an officer that's willing to serve in that capacity? Well, we would open it up like we do with any other okay. position within the Fort Worth Police Commission. We would just fill that. And they'll apply it. Yes, okay. Yes, yes. You're saying they send you 40000 a year through restricted funds? No, no. So we have the educational piece of restricted. That part has to go towards the educational piece, which we can use for an enforcement and educational officer. Okay. And then, so between the two, the unrestricted funds are restricted. How much do they send you in unrestricted funds? I think one we, was like 25000 the other one was. And that's based on a percent of the revenues? And that's, or they send yes. more than they're required? No, they're sending what they're required to send. And so we get it in, in, in sort of. Two batches. One goes to the city, which is unrestricted. The other goes to the police department, which is restricted for education and enforcement. So they don't get any of the unrestricted. We get the, the unrestricted. No, we, no. Oh. we get a restricted amount is for education. We get mm -hmm. an unrestricted amount, which can be used for anything. But both of them would be combined to go towards the city. So what are these funds being used for now? Because I think the last time we talked, it was for training, um, time on the range, ammunition, et cetera. So we have purchased the uh, golf cart, the fatal vision goggles, the, the material to give the kids we've hoped to get. So we've used it uh, several times. And then we use that to offset some of the equipment if we have to purchase. Um, I know uh, we went towards the offsetting the cost of we ran with other than badges, uh, different equipment. I would have to look at the list, but that's the only unrestricted. So if you go ahead and create this position and dedicate those funds to it, how are you going to cover the cost of those other activities? Well, so that was just a, you know, looking above and beyond and having to stay within, within the budget, but the position is going to benefit me greatly. Now, the educational piece of it, we've got the big expenses stuff, like we bought the cradle, the all, the, all the expensive stuff we've purchased. And as more we get involved with the, with the alcohol law enforcement officer, they go to conferences that are funded by the ABC board and things like that, and they are, we're given material once we're part of the, um, the affiliation with the ABC board. I'm not talking about say that, going to the train and becoming members of the, uh, and going to the conferences and members of the association that they provide you along with. It's like any, any other group, once you get involved with it, they give you right now, we, we've purchased a lot of, we, we have a ton of educational material we didn't get to get out because we got it and then COVID hit, so we're actually in a good position. But it, it, like I say, that, that money we would use and apply to it, and I think that would be a much better use. Would that be a full-time position? I, that, that's where we're lacking now. That's what I'm saying. I think that it should be a full-time a full position since they're paying the majority of it anyway. And then you guys have to make it. Like I said, they're not just restricted to doing that. But if we're going to run it the right way, we should be constantly focused on it. Because if we get some, some city staff member, we're out there going to vent. And or something we're doing alcohol stuff and we do something wrong and we're not, you know, then we there's liability on the city and or whatever you know groups put it on. So I just think there's a lot of a lot of benefits to having someone in house rather than having to rely on someone else to come down and check out the situation when it's over when we could have our own people to, to check. It's not uncommon, it's like you know, I know the city has their own that yeah. uh, has their own they're, they're assigned to a detective bureau and they have to speak different languages. They get this person. Another thing that we control by is like sending someone into the store to see if people are serving our underage kids. See, that's something we just we don't have a lot of time to invest in. And I think that's important for our city because that's where this person really coordinates that and makes sure that they stay on top of things like that or make sure they're not going to a bar to get served underage or over served. But that is a, a serious issue too. We've had I didn't realize there were 60 establishments that sold alcohol. Incredible. Is there enough? Uh, I'm just trying to, like, could we take whatever amount we need above the 40000 to pay for this position from the other funding that comes from the ABC store? Yes, sir. Okay. So we could actually fund this whole position without hitting the general fund? Correct. Okay. 
mean, can you link that to this position in perpetuity that it'll be funded from the ABC proceeds? As long as the Belmont ABC store makes a profit, which they're paying off their debt this fall, my understanding. So, you know, they were, they were more profitable earlier than what they had planned. So, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that kind of makes sense. And if they go out of business, then we don't have the demand. Right, and that's what I'm saying. And, and I also understand that, you know, if the funds decrease, if they, you know, something happens, then obviously we have to go back to the drawing board because we're based on most Most of the time what happens, ABC will just, they provide enough of the funds to provide an officer, which they give <coughs> to the city that they designate that for us. So really, ultimately, the city is paying for it out of contribution from ABC. Yeah, I mean, I think that kind of makes sense. You have the store fund, the officer, then enforces. It's, you know, kind of a virtuous circle of funding and enforcement. Thank you, Chief. So, so direction, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to vote for the position today, but just direction to let the chief, you know, proceed with this and coming up with a yeah. job description mm -hmm. and a change that we would bring to you at a future mm -hmm. council meeting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's some cooperation there, too. Downtown officer, perhaps if that's where everybody's buying the drinks and it's overserved, you know, there's teams of it. So, um, maybe we could increase that presence. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate that. I think we're going into a closed session. Is, is our outside attorney? Okay. Telephone. Okay. Um, who else do we need, Shelly? I'd like to have Shelly. And, uh, and Kevin. And Kevin. Okay. Well, I would move that we uh, go into closed session. I'll second. Per uh, uh,